The eternal link to internal source. The key of imagination, your admission. Access to the enlightened dimension. The gateway at the junction of darkness and light. The place at which the chaos of our conditioned frame of mind give way to a life in constant flux. Only to be mastered through vigilant discipline. Peaceful times may come. Testing times may go. This is the ebb and flow. Hello, everybody. This is Augustus. Uh, I have an amazing guest today. His name is Luis Rodriguez. Uh, this is the Reality Now podcast in conjunction with the Ebb and Flow podcast. Um, I just want to introduce my guest for a minute. His name is Luis Rodriguez. He's an American poet, novelist, journalist, critic, and columnist. He was the 2014 Los Angeles Poet Laureate. Rodriguez is recognized as a major figure in contemporary Chicano literature, identifying himself as a native Chicanx writer. His best-known work, Always Running, La Vida Loca, Gang Days in L.A., received the Carl Sandburg Literary Award and has been controversial. And um, it's an incredible book, really wonderful. I can't recommend it enough. Um, Mr. Rodriguez is the founder and co-founder of nonprofit organizations including Tia Chucha's Centro Cultural. Uh, Rodriguez has been active in politics as well. He was the 2012 vice presidential nominee of the Justice Party. In 2014, Rodriguez ran as the Green Party of California's candidate for governor of California and received nearly 67,000 votes. And he's the candidate in the 2022 California gubernatorial election endorsed by the Green Party and the Peace and Freedom Party um Luis welcome thank you for being here today yes it's my pleasure thank you for having me yeah man um so there's a lot I want to talk to you about um but this book particularly we can start there uh always running you know I, w I, was, I reading was reading further, further on uh on this, on this book, book and it's um I didn't read this I hadn't read this before, but it says it's been contrasted to uh, Celine and Orwell, and I love Celine. I love that mm. Celine book, Journey to the End of the Night. That's a great mm -hmm. comparison mm -hmm. for this. Yeah, um, yeah. It's been somebody even called it close to something that John Steinbeck would write, which I wouldn't go that far. But I would just say it's an important book, especially for our time and for the world that we're in. Yeah. And it's interesting, <clears throat> like for our time, it, it was written in '93. And yeah. I read it, and I was just like, man, this book is so relevant, even today. Well, you know, we're celebrating so. the 30th anniversary of the L.A. Uprising. And the book mm. appeared a year after that, and it came timely. I didn't plan it this way, but it came right perfectly because people now wanted to know about L.A. gangs. What's up with the Bloods right. and Crips? What's up with these Chicano gangs? What's up? They had no idea, and yet they knew from the L.A. Uprising the role that they played. And uh, I wanted, I didn't know, but that I would have a book that would tell, especially the Chicano end of it. Uh, we knew somewhat about the black um, experience in the gangs, but the Chicano story hadn't been told, so it was important to have that story out there. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, so, Luis, Luis um, so, so on, on that, that note, what, what was the, the impetus, impetus to write this book? book? You know, you're, you're, I, I had read, read that, that your father, father was a teacher, teacher. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I would, I would imagine, imagine, you know, when you, you talk, talk a bit about that in the book, how that had inspired your different, um, you know, going to schools with him and reading certain books. Um, but when did you realize that this book needed to be written? So it was important that my dad inculcated the love of reading, which it, it, you don't have that with a lot of Mexican migrants because they're mostly workers. Some of them only go first or third grade. You know, they don't have a lot of education in Mexico. Uh, my dad and my mom were highly educated. Unfortunately, when they came here, they couldn't get recognized. Their credentials weren't recognized. My dad retired as a janitor. And my mother worked in the garment industry when she wasn't taking care of us. But they had books in the house, my dad in particular. 
And that was great. No, None of my brothers and sisters, by the way, cared about the books. I did. And mm-hmm. I always say that was my saving grace. When I was in the gang, I was joined the gang at 11. I was on drugs at 12. I was in and out of the jail, juvenile hall. I was kicked out of the house at 15. And I was living in the streets for the longest time. I was homeless for three years. But one mm-hmm. of the things that really helped me was the downtown Central Library. Because mm-hmm. it was my refuge. I was spent hours there. Got me out of a lot of trouble. Uh, I, I unfortunately was on heroin, and I had a twenty-two handgun that I would mug people. But what really saved me was that I loved that. I know I, I'm, I'm honest about what I done, but I, it's I, innate, I yeah. and I don't condone any of it. You know, it was terrible right, the kind of right. life I was living. But the books were my. They opened up the world to me. You know, books never yelled at me, never put me down, never said I never mounted nothing. Books were just. I mean, I'm talking about Ray Bradbury in science fiction. I'm talking about E.B. White, mm-hmm. Charlotte's Web. Even the children's books were mm-hmm. fascinating. I'm talking about all the black books. Black power books were very powerful. Malcolm X had come out. James Baldwin was there. Uh, there was Nikki yeah. Giovanni and her poetry. There were so many amazing books. I was eating up these books. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, man. And then, um, you know, I wanted to talk to you about Because this book to me is really um, a service. You know, I feel like it's really something that, um, you know, because uh, like Like you said, said, like you you talked about about the honesty. I mean, you had to go, you had to tell stories that I feel like traditionally people wouldn't have the heart or courage to tell, or they might have been too embarrassed or ashamed to tell. So, you know, I really feel like this this book is like a serviceable act, you know. Oh, good. Um, good. How do you feel about that? Well, here's the thing. Um, I went through it. I survived it. Unlike a lot of my friends, I lost 25 friends by the time I was 18. You know, gang violence. Police killed four of them. Uh, heroin overdoses. A, a number of ways that people can die in these streets. I survived it all, and I felt compelled, deeply compelled, to tell these stories. But I had no outlet. Nobody was giving me opportunities. You know, they all expected me to work in the factories and the assembly lines. And uh, and I did. I, I To stay out of trouble and not go back to jail, I worked in a steel mill for four years. I worked in construction. I worked in a paper mill and a lead foundry. In other words, I kept working and working, but there was something inside of me about telling these stories. And I remember getting very sad. One time I was in the steel mill. I became a mechanic, a millwright, and I was up repairing this overhead crane and I saw the still being poured and they have all this sulfur heat you know just really hot you have to wear masks and everything Mm -hmm. but I started to to get very sad because I felt even though I love that work nothing wrong with that work I was Mm -hmm. losing this poetry inside of me I was losing this story Mm -hmm. I knew it I Mm -hmm. knew that if I kept doing this I would never be able to tell the story and and I don't know why I was I had this compelling need to write this book. It just, it had hanged with me for 20 years before it actually got done. Right. Yeah, I mean, and that's interesting. When I was reading the book, there's this, um, there's this essence about you and the character in the book, which is you, it's not necessarily a character, but, um, you know, you're sort of on the outside looking in. Like you keep having these moments when a battle would be going on or, you know, the dances you talk about where you're kind of an observer. Like it seems like that was always in you from a young age where you were kind of documenting the experience as, and you know, what is that? That's That's some some mysterious mysterious thing thing to me. me. I don't don't know. know. It It could be a grace. It could be something something where where you, I don't know. I don't don't know. I don't know know what that, that is where you had something where you were able to separate yourself from it a little bit. Well, um, obviously I wasn't separate from it. I participated, but I think what it was, it was having this destiny of a storyteller. Uh, I had a friend who told me yeah. that we all have all these elements in our, uh, that determine who we are. You know, fire, rain, wind, mm. air, all these things. But one mm. of the ones that African tribes have is mineral the rocks, Mm. and the rocks are the slow Mm. stories of the earth. And if you have this Mm. element in you, like a destiny calling thing, you're the storyteller. 
you're the poet. You're the one that uses language. And, and somehow that's what allowed me to be in the midst of all this stuff because I have been shot at half a dozen times. I have shot people. I have, I was in the middle of everything. I used heroin. I did everything. But I was right. also in, like you say, in this kind of weird place where I could observe and keep the story going. And I, I didn't know this, mm -hmm. that I was really the storyteller, and I became the storyteller. For those that didn't have no voice, mm -hmm. couldn't tell their stories, were too messed up or whatever, they, they, they never could tell. I had to tell those stories. That's why I even named those 25 friends in the front of the book, so that mm -hmm. to forget who they mm -hmm. were, real people, real human beings, and I had to tell their story. Right. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I don't mean to say that you weren't right in the mix of it. I just thought that there's an interesting... Well, you're, you're right you about know, one thing, because if people get in the midst yeah. of it, they're not going to be storytellers for the most part. They're not going to be writing the poetry, right, you know right. what I mean? There is something, like you're yeah, pointing yeah. out, there's another extra thing that I had that mm -hmm. allowed me to begin mm -hmm. to observe enough, especially when I got older, a little bit of maturity, some hindsight, to pull it together. Mm -hmm. um, I think most people living their life are not going to be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean there's, there's there's a certain, a certain kind, kind of journalistic, journalistic aspect, and, and maybe, maybe you know, know maybe, maybe when you, maybe while those situations were happening, you weren't as introspective, or mm -hmm. you know, it's like it's like there's that thing that is said: uh, the mind that houses the problem can't conceive of the solution. Very it's true. like when you're in it. When you're in it, it's yeah. hard to see your way out of it. So maybe that came later. Well, but there I'm, is a feeling when yeah, I read, you know, yeah. when I read the book that you're you're able to separate yourself a little bit. Well, one know? of the things that happened is that when I was I was arrested, one of the worst arrests I have arrested for attempted murder, assaulting police. Those are the worst one, but the worst one was they tried to get me for the murders of three people. I was a murderous role, right. and I had the cell next to Charles Manson, uh, briefly. Yeah. But what happened is. People were playing cards. They were goofing around. You had these um, cells, very stark cells, all black and brown, one white guy, Charles Manson. But what happened is <laughs> somebody had a pen or pencil, and I started to write. So even in the midst mm -hmm. of all this madness, believe it or not, I was already developing this writing thing, already developing the observing story thing. You know, it was really weird, mm -hmm. but I was already, even in the midst of it, everything. I had people put right. razor blades to my neck during that time. I had to stand up to him because that's what you do. I had to show no fear, which yeah. is what you do. But I also sat down and started right. to write. People thought it was weird, but the, you know, that's him. Mm. Uh, I was already beginning this journey that I got on, for, um, that I've been on for all oh, most of my life now. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you, um, you know, in terms of the service aspect of it, you know, did you ever think that, uh, you know, this, this could be successful, you know, did you, did you, while you were writing, did you ever imagine like, wow, this could potentially be popular and yeah. affecting in the way it is, in the way it's, uh, it's become and revealed itself to be? I never imagined that, but I did know one thing. I wanted to write the most powerfully literary book. I wanted to be well-written. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I've seen other people writings, and I and I had already developed. By the way, I let go of that industrial work to go to school, became a journalist, mm -hmm. uh, worked in that industry, the part of the writing thing. I wanted to be so well written that nobody would miss the message and they would get the poetry of that life, but also the story. So I didn't contemplate that anybody was going to love it. I just knew I had to do it. And the catalyst, as you know, was my own son, because he joined the gang mm -hmm. at fifteen. He got in trouble. Mm -hmm. He ended up doing about 15 years in prison. I mean, he got more into it than even then because what was happening is everything that I had left then got worse. That life in the 60s and 70s that all of us were in, and it was hardcore, but now everybody was hardcore. There was gangs everywhere. There was a spread of gangs all over the country, and you know, by the 90s, 80s and 90s was the worst period of gang violence in L.A., and I was in Chicago mm -hmm. too, so L.A. and Chicago mm -hmm. were the gang epicenters of gangs, both those cities. And they're the two most industrial cities, so there's a connection to industry and especially industry leaving. So I knew that this story was important for millions of people. 
people were starting to get tough on crime, get rid of gangs, you know, gang injunctions. Would they start to go crazy with the gangs? I said, no, I'm, I, I know what they need. They don't need to be tough on crime. They need treatment, resources, caring. They don't need to be scared straight. They need to be cared straight. I knew that much, and I knew mm -hmm. my book was going to help with that John dialogue. I didn't realize it was going to be big. It was going to be a bestseller. I didn't realize I was going to be on Oprah Winfrey and Good Morning America and Entertainment Weekly and a whole bunch of places. But I'm glad. I'm glad because right. it's an important part of the story that gets missed. Yeah. Which leads me to the absurdity of a book like this being censored. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are so many, you know, I was thinking about it before we before we got on here, you know, because this book has been censored. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it it's been on a lot of lists and like the top 100 books that are yeah. censored. And I'm yeah. just like, well, it's not it's not super sexually egregious. I've read many books that are more sexually yes. kind of yeah. overt and excessive yeah. and unnecessary. The crime in it is is true so yeah. it's not like embellished crime right um why would a book like this be censored i mean i don't that just baffles me well i think we're living a time have you, have you i'm sure yeah. you've yeah no i think we're living in a time yeah. where people want a fantasy they've been pushing it in schools mm -hmm. it's been going on for a long time and you know now it's being challenged to me even critical race theory is really the battle to challenge the fantasy of schools mm. and history and literature. They want to create a fantasy. This world is rent with impoverishment, with class strife, with racial issues, and, and yet they want to pretend it doesn't exist. So what they're censoring is reality in the classroom. They don't want reality mm. in the classroom. They want these fantasized books that everything's great, America's wonderful, everything's beautiful. And I, I'm an American. I love America. I'm not against America, but I want the reality of America. You know, there's a lot of good things in America, and there's a lot of things that aren't mm -hmm. good, and I want it to be addressed because that's how we move forward. Mm -hmm. And yet we got these people mm -hmm. who are creating these fantasy worlds, and there is no racial discrimination, and there is none of this, and, uh, uh, and they're creating a world that doesn't exist. They're censoring, and they're, they're the ones complaining about cancel culture, but they're canceling amazing books. My book is still being banned along with a lot of other books. My Angelou gets banned mm -hmm. and, and Toni Morrison right. and we can name a whole mess of people. So to me it's yeah. about do we have reality or do we have a fantasized, idealized, made up world that somebody else wants to push? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's very powerful. It's very powerful. Um well, I mean that's why I'm so, you know, happy to have you on here because this is a book that i feel everybody should read um oh, thanks yeah you know yeah and yeah you know what about los angeles you know i love the uh there's so much incredible through the darkness there's a lot of really like incredible nostalgia i feel like mm. of los angeles like the train yeah. tracks and the cornfields and yeah. the hills and yeah you know um how do you feel about some? I know we're changing topics here, but That's you know, uh, we'll just we'll just roll roll with you know where it yeah, goes. But yeah. um, how do you feel about that? Like Los Angeles changing these days? Is there a certain nostalgia that you miss about it? Well, somewhat, but I will have to say, I I, I this part of the, my life, I started in Watts, which has gone through a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. Watts was always black and brown; it was always poor. Uh, but it was good. It was a good community, working class. Um, and then from there, we went to the San Gabriel Valley. And what people don't know about the San Gabriel Valley, just to be clear, at the time, there was 100 Mexican migrant communities. They were picking the oranges, walnuts, and cherries, whatever was They were migrant workers. It started with the so-called Okies and Arkies. Remember the 30s, the Dust Bowl? They came over. They were treated mm -hmm. badly. These were poor white people. They were treated as if mm -hmm. they were from another planet, the same old thing. But by the 40s, these mm -hmm. fields were now Mexican. And mm -hmm. they were the poorest neighborhoods in L.A. County. And I'm talking about look like Appalachia. Mm -hmm. I know I've been to Appalachia. You know, dirt roads, wow. little shacks, uh, goats and chickens in people's backyards. It was more dense than Appalachia. But it was these poor uh -huh. neighborhoods. My neighborhood, Las Lomas, was one of them. Unincorporated. But we were surrounded by then. The orange groves and walnut fields were gone. We were surrounded by well-off white communities 
who were racist. Mm -hmm. John Birch Society ran city councils and school boards. They hated the Mexicans. Mm -hmm. And they had an army, which I call the sheriff's deputies, because we were unincorporated, mm -hmm. that went after us. We were at war all the time. We were at war with these races. We were at war with the sheriff's deputies. We were at war with other Mexican neighborhoods. Uh, I remember when I was in jail the last time, they tried to send me to Vietnam. They said, hey, we, we won't avoid all court here and just go to Vietnam. I said, I'm not going to Vietnam. I'm already at war. I don't need to be in another war. I'm already wow. in a war. I, I want to say something wow. else, though. This wasn't, you know, the poor whites that left, a few of them stayed in my neighborhood, two or three families. Mm -hmm. And we never saw them mm -hmm. as white people. We saw them as homies. They spoke Spanish mm -hmm. like us. Those two or three wow. white families that stayed with us. So it wasn't like we hated white people. We hated the racist, powerful, m wealthy wild whites that were living there. Um, but you should know that by the mid-80s, 80s, it started to change. Uh, that part of the valley, San Gabriel Valley, became very Asian. You know, a lot of mm -hmm. Taiwan, Japanese, Korean. Um, a lot of money was coming in, big money. And it's changed mm -hmm. the whole, the whites aren't really there. I think the San Gabriel Valley now is a 70% Mexican, Central American, 20% Asian, and 10% wow. white and whatever blacks there is. So the whites got pushed out. This is really a mostly Mexican and Asian com uh, community now. But it, they also kind of gentrified it. They pushed all the really poor neighborhoods out. There's a lot of them gone. Mm -hmm. They're all pushed to the desert. You know how the LA's got this thing where now it drove, it's gentrifying all these communities and driving people right. away. So that's what's happened. And I want to get back to the time where um, it was very clear what we were about, who we were dealing with, uh, because it's not so clear when gentrification happens, how it happens, and how you end up homeless. They say it's mental illness and drugs. They go, well, that's part of it. But they were, they're homeless because they're being pushed out. People don't want to talk about right. that. Right, right. Well, I mean, yeah, I've, I've, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn and um, middle, middle class, I'd say. And, uh, but even Brooklyn now, it's like, you need to be, you need to be upper class, you I need know. to be really wealthy to live in a place like I that. Know. So it's like, this obliteration yeah. of the middle class that, yeah. that we've been doing is now affecting every race i feel like it's I almost like it's, it's a yeah you're right you, and know, you know i have and, a granddaughter in brooklyn she lives in crown heights crown heights was a rough place oh it's yeah. high end now it's high end yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah no you're right and i think this is where people get to understand they're trying to divide the white working class from the rest of the working class i mean i've seen books mm -hmm. i've seen I go, look, there is no white working class. There's one working class, and it's all races. Right. And I worked in that mm -hmm. class. But what they're forgetting, during the Reagan period, uh, it wasn't just about Reagan, but during that period, the deindustrialization of all these cities, all these communities, they lost so much industry. L.A. used, in, by 1984, lost 300 factories and plants. Those mills I worked in are wow. gone. Those paper mills are gone. The rubber plants are gone. The, the, all these industries are gone. The, the, uh, the, what do you call it? The, aer um, the aerodynamics, they're gone. Mm -hmm. And that happened across the country. Mm -hmm. So the poverty is really doesn't care what race you are. It cares about that you're right. now you're, you're, like you're pushed out. And it gave people, those jobs gave people middle class status. You could buy a home. You can, you can do so much. I remember it, Bethlehem Steel, where I worked at, Hourly with benefits and everything in the 1980s, late 70s, was $25 an hour. People wow. don't realize how, in those days, we were making it. And we, I thought it was a lifelong wow. job. I remember when I first got my uniform and I got the job, I told my wife, I just barely married my, my high school sweetheart. <laughs> she was pregnant. Uh -huh. I thought my world was set. In a few years, those wow. jobs were gone. I was back in the street. I was wow. homeless again. You know, my marriage fell apart. You know what I'm saying? In other words, we are, we've gone through this devastation and we're forgetting. But now they want to divide us on race. I go, that's silly. Mm. All of us, black, brown, yeah. white, we're all in this terrible devastation that we're right. now seeing the end result of. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, um, well, first of all, Thinking that minimum wage was at some no, point twenty five dollars is baffling. I, I I mean I I'm I've been talking about this. This is just a common topic with 
my friends that are my age particularly because we're just like first of all how did we get to this point where rent has gone rent has continued to go up yet Crazy. minimum wage never moved that Crazy. doesn't make sense oh, I know. and you know louise people my age now we can't start families man i know that we, we don't know how to start <laughs> families brother because we yeah. don't know we don't know how to have a house now no you're absolutely you know right. yes you know and thank thank god my family we own this house yeah yeah but it's like everybody's living here now it's not like it's yeah. my house and i can start a family well guess what um, i have i have my three grown men son my three sons living with me yeah, yeah. they're great exactly. they're great men i'm glad uh, people exactly. have told me get rid of them why, why do you have your sons living with me no i'm not going to do that they they pay they help us with our rent they're uh they're um hard working men you know what i'm saying but they can't live on their yeah. own one of them has a girlfriend. We have a yeah. guest house. Him, um, one of my sons and his girlfriend live there. They can't afford to rent anything. Right. So, as you know, L.A., you know how it is. The L.A. area has gone mad yeah. with, with rents. So we're keeping our house right. intact by having my family there. And it's kind right. of sad because they should be out there on their own. They should have their own life and their own homes and their own families. Uh, right. But I agree with you. This right. is what's happened now. Yeah. And you know who it also affects? To me, it affects the artists, really. Because, you know, artists artists are always, I think, traditionally straggling. Although I don't particularly believe in, you know, start the starving artist idea. Because if you're starving, the last thing you want to do is write or paint. You know, you're trying to find food. Um, but, you know, it's it's an interesting thing. Um, so here's an idea I you know, have. Oh, really quickly, yeah. an idea I have. And you know I'm running for governor in the state of California, so yes, of course, it's related to this. I think we got to pro provide for people's needs as a government, as a mm -hmm. state. However, that happens, we can use private stuff, we can use public, but whatever it is, why? So that people can be full and complete artists, because that's what I think mm. everyone really is. To be a full and mm. complete human being is to be a full, complete artist. And I expand the idea of art. I don't mean anybody's a painter. We're talking about dancers, we're talking yeah. about theater, we're talking about uh, music, we're talking yeah. about uh, writing, of course. There's all kinds of arts. Even the art of teaching, there's art there. The art of mechanics. Somebody, a kid once told me, I told everybody that everybody's an artist. And he goes, I'm not an artist, I'm a mechanic. And I go, well, you know, there's art and mechanics. And if you're a good one, yeah. you're going to know that art. <laughs> and he, right. he brightened up and said, if you're a mechanic, there's an artist there too. So anyway, I think that we ought to set it up so that people aren't hungry no more, have affordable, decent homes have a way to survive, maybe go to school, get health care taken care of so that they can really thrive as human beings. And that means yeah. becoming that creative, you know, imaginative human being that all of us have inside of us. Absolutely. And I think art too, for me, is uh, spirituality. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, when, when, we, when yeah. we lose our spirituality, there's going to be trouble, man. You know what? I, mean, I, I, I agree I with that. The worst poverty isn't just the material poverty, it's the poverty of spirit. Right. And I've seen this. Now, of course, what's great about some communities uh, is they have great spirit even though they're poor. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm plugging it's all in. good. i got to plug this in. Um, yeah. Hold on one second. Yeah. My laptop's dying. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I should have put it in earlier. But, uh, it's all good. But let me just say about what you're pointing out. Uh, the spirit, to me, gets engaged with the arts. It's not the only way, obviously. That's why religion has a lot of artistic, ritual, liturgy. Mm -hmm. Religions have all these beautiful artistic things because I think that's where really spirit gets brung, taken up. And, and I don't care what religion is. All religions is fascinating to me. They're all valid as far as I'm concerned. And if you're not religious, that's fine too. Because I think the spirit is engaged when you engage with art at some level. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I find yeah. that that helps to get rid of the basis of poverty where people don't have to be hungry or whatever, all their needs met, so that they can really engage in that powerful spirituality that's inside of them. That, to me, is, mm -hmm. a, is what's really needed. If we're going to have a governance in society and people talk about the best for everybody, that's the way that I would describe it. Right, right. And, you know, to that point of, um, you know, there's some, there was a really interesting moment in your book to me where the, you talked about how young you were 
getting into gangs, but for me, you know how they were originally called cliques or clicas. And, you know, I thought it was so interesting how these these gangs that you weren't calling them gangs when you were that young, but yeah. they started out really innocently. Yeah. To me, they started out with these young people needing family yeah. and community and wholeness yeah. who, you know, you talk about, you know, kids ar ar around your neighborhood, like mm -hmm. you didn't have the access to the sports or the yeah. clubs. So you created these these cliques, which then evolve into gangs. But to me, they really started out as this kind of innocent endeavor. I agree. And people need to understand young men, young women too, but they need their own communities, need to have their own communities. When you don't have them, proper elders, proper mentors, proper rituals, young people, because it's in their bones, it's like a bone memory thing. They start creating their own little initiatory groups. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. because it's not guided, it could be very dangerous. I think what mm -hmm. happened, though, is by design, uh, a lot of these poor kids, and from all races, gangs don't care, uh, started creating right. these cliques and whatever, little sets, whatever you want to call them. They got pushed into criminality because of mm -hmm. poverty. And, and, mm -hmm. and by the 60s and 70s, I know for a fact, drugs was allowed to infiltrate these communities and guns. And it got worse by the 80s, you know, when crack came. And it got worse by the 80s and 90s. And you had crystal meth, everything. In other words, they push these guns. All you have to do is throw guns and, and, and drugs in any community, and you're going to tear it up. You know, I remember these mm. mostly white communities that used to look down at all these black and brown communities. Go there now. Crystal meth is mm. destroying so many communities, white communities, up and down the country. Uh, people are gangster now. they got these... Young kids looking like cholos, you know, they're all white kids. They've got tattoos everywhere. They're all trying to imitate the only, imitate the only thing they could see from the TV, whatever it was. They're trying to be bloods right. and crips, you know what I'm saying? But they're living that mm -hmm. madness. Uh, my mm -hmm. granddaughter, she's, uh, it's a sad thing, she just got sentenced five years in prison. She's half white, mm -hmm. half Mexican, and she grew up in this white community in northern Illinois. White people, mm -hmm. poor white people, middle class that went back down. Crystal meth everywhere. No jobs, wow. kids standing in the corner, nothing to do. It looks like my neighborhood. But these are white wow. people that used to have it good. You know what I'm saying? So I think, yeah. and they're going to be in bad shape because drugs and guns has infiltrated their neighborhood. They're going to be, they're mm -hmm. already doing the stuff that we used to do 30, 40, 50 years ago. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, you talked about the lack of rituals. And for me, uh, what about the uh, fathers? Can you talk about fatherhood, how important it is to have, you know, there's that kind of cliche, which of course is not a cliche, but we've said it so much that I feel like it's sort of become a cliche about how the young right. man who ends up in criminality doesn't have, have a, a father. father. You know, how, yeah. how, how what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, fathers, when especially with deindustrialization, were being pushed out of the economy. So many more mm -hmm. in the street corner. And then, of course, drugs and guns takes them, and then pretty soon they were not, they're not fathering anymore, and then they're in jail. And they put them in jail for so long, they, can't, they have no momentum to be fathers. So mm -hmm. they're gone. Uh, I would, let me just start personally with my, me. My dad uh, was a very cold, detached, emotionless person, like a lot of fathers. He, you know, mm -hmm. you never cried. He would never um, say, I love you. I mean, you know, I've heard a lot of people tell me, my dad never said, I love you. I'm sure my mm -hmm. dad loved me, but he just didn't have the way to do it. And I'll tell you a story. I was nine years old, and this is what broke me from my dad. I had, there was no real social recreation, uh, but sports, but they started a little league in a mud field. Mm -hmm. And I went there mm -hmm. to give you a little, you know, some businesses give you uniform. And I, I, I was learning baseball, I was nine years old. So they had a father and day, a father and son day. I went to my mm -hmm. dad and cajoled him, please come. Dad got a show, he didn't want to come. And he worked all really hard, janitor all day long. He was working hard. He didn't want to come, but I finally convinced him. So on Saturday, I'm getting into the car. I have my, um, my glove and my ball, I have my little uniform. And I went in the, <laughs> I went in the car, the, the passenger seat. And he com comes around, goes in the car. He's kind of grumbling, but anyway, he's starting the car, but it won't start. The car doesn't mm. start. He's wow. pissed off. I'm just sitting there. He gets out of the car walks around, goes in the house, and doesn't come back. 
I'm mm. sitting there with this glove and ball in this passenger seat mm. waiting for him to come back. He doesn't come back. I was there for the longest yeah. time. I ended up getting out walking. Maybe it was two or three miles to get there. I walked to the ball. I missed the Father Day Son game. I came in late. Wow. But it really broke me for my dad. I didn't have a dad mm. that could even give me the time of day. And this is sad. Whatever traumas he was, he grew up during the Mexican Revolution. He saw some terrible things. You know, anytime you're in war, revolutions, he, he saw some mm. terrible things. He never tell those stories. My mom told the story. She was a great storyteller. My dad just kept yeah. it all in. And I felt that his spirit had been crushed a long time ago. He couldn't be a dad. Wow. So even though my dad would show up and come to work, I didn't have a dad. And I think that that's mm. important because fathers, and I became a much better father because of that. I, whatever my dad did, I did the opposite. Love my kids, show them love, try to make time for them. I wasn't always good with my two oldest kids, I will admit. I abandoned them, unfortunately. But on the other hand, now we're all close. And part of the reason why is because fathers have a crucial role. And their role isn't understood. And it's not to be uh, the, the king of the house. You know, it rey, as we say in the Mexican culture. It's to be that model of protection and, and honoring and respect that young men can look to and say, I know what that is. Because most of these men mm. didn't really get that and didn't know what that looked like. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a very powerful story. Um, you know, and then I feel like rituals mm -hmm. get involved too. And I feel like we're living in a culture where um, young people really don't know what their rituals are. Yeah, You know, the more you know, like, um, and it's across the globe, I feel like, you know, yeah. we, like that idea of like, the Western society, I feel like the Western paradigm of, uh, you know, the Mercedes will save you or the money will save you just is everywhere. And it just, yeah. and we, and we, we realize that it doesn't really work after a while. Yeah. And uh, I don't really know what our rituals are anymore um yeah. you know of course we have the kind of the obvious, obvious ones like, like christmas, christmas and thanksgiving and you know each culture has their, their own i think but, but then i feel like we take, take those, those for, for granted. granted and uh you know i thought it was really interesting in your book too where you started doing the dance at the yeah. games yeah yeah you no. did the uh the Aztec the, dancing. you know yeah yeah, the Aztec dancing, yeah. which the white kids were doing for for God for whatever reason, and then yeah. then you had started doing it, and that kind of gave you uh, some of your culture back in a way. Yeah. But I just feel like we're really we're needing to go back yeah. and look at our you know our rituals and revive, revive those, those in today's ways. world. I think whether it's happening or not, I, I I feel like I need to be optimistic about it. But I think it's a really important thing today. Yeah. Well, I think we've lost our mythic imagination, and I mean mm -hmm. mythology in the good way. Mythology is stories and and way to tell truths and wisdom through metaphors. And we've lost all. That's what rituals really are. They're metaphors that allow us to learn about life. So you go through the struggle and the conflict and the intensity in a metaphor so that you can prepare yeah. for it in reality. And rituals should do that. We lost all that. Now the rituals is get a job, go to work, maybe go to college and end up working at Old Navy. You know, after you got your college degree, right. you spend, got your student loan, you still can't get a job. You're back at McDonald's. You know what I'm saying? I've known people, I know students yeah. like that. So the rituals got changed when the industrial world came and got rid of the elderships including from the mm -hmm. migrants, the immigrants from Europe. They ended up in the inner cities like New York and Philadelphia, Chicago. And, uh, and they were thrown off and now it's the time clock. Now it's the boss, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Now you have to do, mm -hmm. and that destroys whatever rituals used to exist. And pretty soon you got fathers who are drinking because it's a stressful life. And you got mothers who feel abandoned and you got kids that are on the street, you know. This is the life that was created by that industrial world. Now we're in the post-industrial world, and we're still carrying echoes of that. But what we need to do mm -hmm. is think about what is the, where is our Mexican imagination coming from now? How do we have those metaphors mm -hmm. and stories and those rituals that allow us mm -hmm. to think about ourselves, what we bring, who we are, where we're meant to live, how we can live fully? You know what I'm saying? How do we live in a world mm -hmm. with so many, so much woundedness and so much loss? How do we traverse our, our way through that? 
That's what we need right now because we're losing, as you're saying, generations of young people are completely lost, don't know where they're going. And this is why suicide is big among young people, as you know, mm -hmm. but it's also big among mm -hmm. the elders, the olders. Uh, they yeah. don't know who they yeah. are. They don't know what they're, what, mm -hmm. what they're meant to do. Suicide's bigger mm -hmm. among those two groups, and that goes to show you that the heart of our culture is missing something about who we are. Yeah, that's very interesting. You know, and then something that came to my mind is, uh, of course, the arts. I mean, mm. the arts, particularly, particularly like theater, yeah. poetry, arts yeah. that aren't so tech, tech, you know, mechanized. You know, yeah. I love film, but like film, you need all sorts of stuff, cameras, yeah, etc. You, you know, but you get to yeah. that, you need a lot of yeah, money, yeah, yeah. but you get to that bones art yeah. of like, right. you know, something like theater, and yeah. you know, for instance. Uh, there, you know, in chapter seven of your book, you know, you've got so much reform going on. You're, you're, you know, you're working really hard. You're, you're kind of in and out of the gang world and you've got, uh, you know, Chente, the character Chente, you know, mentoring you to, and, and you're kind of straddling these yeah. two worlds, I feel like. Yeah. And there's this moment where you write these three, three plays. plays. Yeah. And one of the plays is about the gangs coming, coming together, together. Yeah, I know. Which, which is which, which was, was pretty, pretty mind blowing, blowing for you to do that and have the the courage to do that. that. And, and um, you know, know did, did it ever feel like, like you were taking one, one step forward and two steps back? back? I mean, how yeah. hard was that yeah. road for you? I, I imagine you're trying to get out of this thing, yeah. but then you're just being kicked back in. That's exactly right. You know, right. and he, and a lot and a lot of times you didn't even want to go. Yeah. You know, your homies, homies would, would show up and be like, like, hey, man, let's do this thing. And you'd be like, I know. fuck, I guess I got to go. I don't know. You I know? was I was in a terrible conflict. Once my mentor entered my life and gave me an imagination that I could have another life. Most of these kids this is don't, Chente? Chente. Most of these kids don't right. have imagined there's another life. And, and, they're, right. and they're held by the web of La Vida Loca, the crazy life. They, and I say right. they're held because that web is, is very fatalistic. It is what it is. You got to do what it expects of you, and and I was given a glimpse of maybe you don't have to do what other people expect of you. Maybe you have your own internal drive to do something. This is what a mentor does, and I was caught. I was yeah, one foot in, one foot out, back and forth, and that's the struggle in those in those chapters is that I'm caught. I'm I'm moving forward, but then I shoot somebody. You know, I'm moving forward, but then I have a <laughs> heroin. You know, I'm back on heroin. People don't know that this is how young people struggle. And this is why I have a lot of patience for them. Because this Chente, the real guy, I, I, named, I renamed him, was so patient with me. Right. I'm sure he hated me. I'm uh, sure he probably maybe didn't hate me, but he pretty was pissed off at me. He was so patient. Right. I used to tell him to drop dead, you know, screw you, I don't want to do with you. But he kept, right. kept coming back. I'm sure he just wanted to drop. He, he never did. And... And then I began to see that he knew stuff that I wanted to know. Mastery of life is what he was trying to teach. And that's what a good master does. A good master isn't trying to say, I'm the master, you're no good. He's trying to say, if I'm a master, you can be your own master. That's what a good mm. a teacher does. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, well, you know, in terms of like... Uh, what about the police? You know, how do you how do you feel like moving forward? Because, because there's, there's a lot of interaction with the with law enforcement in your book, yeah. and I mean, there's such a there's such a disconnect to me in um, why don't I have a better relationship with the police? Just on just on an obvious level, yeah. you know, like. You guys are supposed to be part of the community. I mean, yeah. if we're looking at this in a tribal, tribal sense, sense. Yeah. you know, you know in, a, the, in a more primal sense, if, if you men and women are the safeguards, so to speak, of our community, why don't we have better relationships with them? And uh, I just think that's something that, we, that, I, that I would hope we can work on. And maybe because of all the uprising in our world, it's like, we're just going to have to, whether we like it or not. I don't know. I mean, wh what are your thoughts on well, that? Particularly you know, running, running for, for governor. governor. Yeah, I know. I was uh, talking to a guy, a good friend of mine, Irish-American guy, who told me, how, uh, he grew up in Queens, but he's telling me how this idea that um, the Irish were treated really badly, as you know. 
Right. When they came the famine and everything. But one of the ways that they were able to control a lot of the Irish uprising spirit was to hire them as peace officers against their own community. Mm -hmm. As you know, especially if you go mm -hmm. to Chicago and these other things, a lot of peace officers were Irish because that was the mm -hmm. one thing, the job they could get, but it was being important that they detach from the community and police that community. You know what I'm saying? It was important mm -hmm. that they became the arm uh, or the army for the greater, wider racist community that was out there. And, and mm -hmm. it laid a basis for the detachment. I don't really... You guys are no good. You're the reason why we're all messed up. You're still hanging on to your Irishness, whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? Right, and and I right. think I've seen this all the way through. Even now, I go into prisons. Many of these prisons are now mostly black and brown COs, correction officers. There's whites right. there, but mostly black right. and brown. I go in the police departments. Now they're black and brown, but guess what? They're not just as bad or worse when they were just white races there. They're policing. Mm. They're setting you up. They're straightening you out. You guys are all messed up. Why are you doing this? And so we're living mm -hmm. in a world in which the detached police department and highly militarized becomes deadly. And mm -hmm. I think that's what we're trying to do. When people say defund the police, they're not trying to say we want this poor guy working as a police officer and not have a job. We're talking about people who come in there with power, the life, the, the life of, uh, uh, and death, the ability to control the life and death of people in those communities. That, to mm -hmm. me, has to be removed. We should put money where it needs to go, in our schools, in our families, in our kids, in our resources, in our arts. We should put it mm -hmm. on the front end, not the back end where crime happens, and then the police come in. These are highly militarized police forces. LA, the budget, the LA budget, $3.5 for police. This is the highest, I mean, by far, if you get the budget, wow. the highest of any budget. And we know the LAPD has killed people they shouldn't have killed, has put down people. There was just uh, shots of the abortion struggle and people are protesting. I saw the police mm. tackling people and everything. I'm sure some people are doing things they shouldn't be doing, but these cops are really overboard pushing people mm. down. And I said, we don't need mm. that. We need to get away from a society in which police and, and prisons are the way we handle the problems of society instead of going back to, again, those issues. What do people need? Why is there poverty? Why is there even homelessness? We're not addressing that. We're trying to do the back end. Well, we don't know why, but here it is. Let's get the police there. Uh, and I feel yeah. bad because I want to be in the trenches of the police. I think the police are given, mm -hmm. being given a, a, the wrong end of the deal when they're told you're the ones that can stop crime. Crime is not a police issue. It's not a police problem. It's a mm -hmm. society problem. And we're putting mm -hmm. that on them. And some of them get abusive because it's too much. As you know, police go through higher divorce rates, more alcoholism rates, high suicide rates. It's, mm -hmm. We're doing injustice to all of us if we say that police are the answer to all these things. Mm. Yeah. Wow, that's really, really powerful and important. Um, and then what about, you know, you didn't have social media back in your day. What's your thoughts on, you know, social media on justice? It seems like a, a bit of a double-edged sword. You know, yeah. we get so much information that yeah. I feel like it can be overwhelming, yet it's yeah. revealing certain truths that, like you said, people didn't want to see the reality. Yeah. Now everybody has a camera in their pocket and yeah. it's just... It's yeah. inevitable to see what the reality is. Uh, it's got its good and bad things. I, I think, though, it's, it all depends. What, what I hate for people to lose is vision and imagination. If all social media is reflective of all the problems, you know what I'm saying, reflective of mm. everything else, I don't think that's good enough. I want to know out of all this, who are the strategic thinkers? Who are the ideas for our time? It gets lost in the social media world. Um, I, I personally look for that, uh, but I find that the voices that they're pushing are really the voices are not m really imaginative ideas. The retrograde voices get pushed, you know. Oh, well, people mm. need to have common sense. People need to be more uh, practical. People, if these voices are coming out. People need to be more capitalist, and you know, that's not. I'm seeing all this stuff. I said, no, no, we we can't discern anymore where the powerful new ideas are because everything gets given the same space or whatever, whoever's got more money to push it. But I do think that right. it's true. The reality is there. It's in your face. But now we need to know who can give us the, the vision of where this is taking us. Where do we need to go? How do we go? Uh, I'm hoping to be one of those voices. That's why I'm in the governor's race. I don't want right. to turn over the electoral arena to all the corporations that control almost everything, including social media. 
We need to be in there to struggle for that new reset, that new systemic way of looking at things, not just managing crisis, but getting to the root of things. That's what I'm trying to get at, that there is a, a hopeful, beautiful, bountiful way to get through all this crisis. But it's hard to hear that voice. And even me running for governor is hard because it takes big money. I'm doing it with mm. grassroots money. I'm doing it with very, but where momentum is building, I'm going up and down the state. I'm meeting community people. I'm meeting youth and even elders. Who say, I've never voted, don't want to vote, but for you, I'm going to vote. I'm meeting really yeah. good people, but do I have enough momentum without having the big ads and the big social media? I don't know. It's another right. world. I hope to keep doing it to at least make sure that people can see there's got to be other voices and other choices. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've got my vote, but I mean, just even, just even the fact that your voice is in the conversation, yeah. you know, like, and yes, you want to win, but to me, regardless of winning or losing, the fact that your voice is there is, is to me just as powerful and important to the whole, the whole deal. Um, I just said that. That means a lot, to right? What you just said yeah. means a lot. Um, I'm winning even if I don't win, if we can articulate Dude. properly what we're trying to say and why. The rituals, the need for mentors, the fathers, the role of fathers, the, the role of, of mythic imagination and the time, the spirit yeah. that needs to keep, you know, embraced and pushed forward. If we can have those voices, uh, we're winning even if we don't actually win. Because that's yeah. what's important for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and you talked about the hope and the optimism. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, faith, the words faith and fear, you know, um, in our culture today? Well, I think, okay, I have a, a again, the make the world that's now predominant, like the nation state. It's a made-up thing. But people are dying for nation states. What Ukraine and Russia, two made up countries, by the way, recently within the last 200 years or whatever, made become countries. Now they're like dying and killing each other. They're the same people at certain levels. Again, they're different too. But that's what's right. going on in the, in the world. Uh, we got people from Honduras and Guatemala and El Salvador, beautiful Mayan, Mesoamerican people, you know, who are now can't live in their states, they have to rush across to Mexico, which mm. sometimes treats them good, sometimes it mostly doesn't, and they have to come to the United States, get treated as badly people. These are the original peoples. You know, they don't no right. longer relate, except for Guatemalans and some Mexicans, they don't longer relate as indigenous, but they are, you look at them. These are indigenous people who have been de-indianized and now they're treated like the worst people. But the, it, prison, the nation state has imprisoned us, and now we're fighting. The same goes with faith and belief systems. Belief systems are important. Having faith in the, what you believe in, trust. I, th I look at faith more like trust. I trust in God. I trust in my family. I trust in my community. It's, uh, we lose it. We don't, uh, faith in, in things that don't matter or just illusions. I don't want no faith in an illusion. You know, and a lot of right. religion has become an illusion for people. They're hanging on to the illusion. It's like, that's not what faith is. But the fear is what drives us closer to the illusion. People are living in these illusions and don't understand it's fear that pushes there. The best way to deal with any illusion is not to get rid of the illusion, it's get rid of the situation that required an illusion in the first place. To get rid of those mm -hmm. situations where live the circumstances that we're in that forces us to think, I gotta, I gotta have an illusion about where I'm going. You know, I tell, okay, I'm gonna tell you something, another way to put this. I was on heroin for seven years. I'm glad I'm not on mm -hmm. it. I drank for 20 years on top of it. Now I've been sober for 29. But I will say this, yeah. when people talk about heaven, and I'm saying not all Christians, mm. I love Christians, I like a lot of good friends who are Catholic Christians, they talk about, to me, like if they're going to a heroin high. Because oh, wow. heaven has no pain, everybody wow. gets along, you don't have to worry about nothing. I go, hey, that's what heroin tries to get you. And I get it, heroin's <laughs> phony and it's dangerous, but it's like, that's not heaven to me, to just be wow. without, I mean, but that's where people are at now. Their, their idea of heaven is to be on a high, a euphoric high mm. forever. That's an illusion wow. that people get imposed on. You know, so I think we have to yeah. change the circumstances that forces people mm. to even have illusions because it is kind of related, I hate to say this, um, to the idea that even drugs push you there, religion can push you there, and both of them are filled with illusions. 
That's so, oh man, that's so interesting. And it's also, that, that was exactly what I was going to ask you about, about next. Mm. Sobriety, mm. the importance, you know, I just got six months um, mm. recently. Wow. And, uh, yeah. Thank yeah. you, man. And, um, you know, there's that acronym for sober, son of a bitch, everything is real, yeah. which I always thought was funny. And, you know, in your book, you talk a lot about addiction. You talk about alcoholism, yeah. this and that drug. And, you know, can you talk a little bit about what sobriety has given you and the importance of that? And I also really, you know, I think like we were talking about earlier, the spirituality and like you're saying about the drug can kind of substitute uh mm -hmm. It's another illusion and yeah. it's another way to escape and yeah. not be in the moment of what's yeah. really going on. And I know a lot of people are struggling, man. I was that person that yeah. needed the drug to get by and, yeah. you know, needed the thing to feel okay. But like, you know, my surrender and something has been, you know, my path has been that First of all, reality is so interesting and so much more interesting and full yeah. uh, when I'm when I'm sober. But um, it's a real it's a real thing that I think we have to look at that's run rampant across our world. You know, yeah. a, addiction and different abuses. Um, can you talk a little bit about your uh, sobriety? Well, it goes back to what we're saying. Uh, we don't have the metaphors, so. Mm. We want to live in a world without pain. I know I was on heroin to escape. I know that I, the pain isn't just physical pain. It was the deep emotional pain. The father that wasn't there, the mother that didn't understand, was frustrated, whatever. The communities that had all these gaps, whatever these losses were. And so I learned one thing. Being sober is back in pain. But pain is life. Mm. Life is pain. Mm. And it's not all pain. But you can't have joy without understanding the pain of it. I had to open up, and it took me a long time. The pain of being a father to my own kids, that's painful. But there's also a lot of joy there, you know. And I had to make my mistakes, but I had to do it sober because I was trying to do it without sobriety, which means, I mean, I was missing a lot of fatherhood there. Uh, I, that's why my oldest kids are pissed off at me because I wasn't there for them. On the other hand, I was there for my youngest kids who are like my sobriety kids, you know. But... Mm. I had to be there for all of them then. And then you're facing with your own. You're, now you have to face your own, the mask that you carry. I have, a, a, like I said, my granddaughter is going to prison. She's five years. She's a crystal meth head for about six years. You know, mm. she doesn't need prison. She needs treatment. But that's not the world that we're in. Mm. And she messed up. Right. They, they gave her opportunities. They gave her a recovery program. She escaped. She wouldn't show up. I get it. But see, that's because she needs help. And she said, no, she's done enough, we're going to put her in prison. But I remember one time I talked to her, and she was complaining about her dad, my son, who was in prison and was on drugs, who's now clean, was trying to tell her to get help. And she was tired of it, so she complained to me, well, why is my dad, he doesn't understand me. And I told her, okay, here's one thing you should know, Mija, my daughter, my granddaughter. Mm -hmm. You don't have to listen to anybody. The only person you have to answer to is that face in the mirror. And if you don't love that person in the mirror, there's nothing I can say, nothing I can do. No recovery program is going to help you. Recovery program isn't the end all be all. They're just tools. They're only tools. Use them. And if you can't use them, if they don't mean them for you, it ain't going to work. You have to look at that person and care enough about that person. And if that isn't there, then that's what you got to work on. You know what I'm saying? I had to tell her that because she was complaining about oh, everybody trying to get her to tell her what to do, get on recovery, help, and everything else. I go, that's the only one you have to answer to. She hasn't talked to me since, you know, oh, wow. <laughs> because it's wow. hard. It's hard. And I know that's what, what she's in, the pain that she's in, and, uh, and she has to hide away, and mm -hmm. she just can't face that. So this is what sobriety is. You're facing mm -hmm. all of it. The cracks yes. in the wall, you're facing all of it. But also there's good things there. I tell people it's not just going through pain and struggle and, and my rage would come up and everything, but you will start getting to the grief, to the source of the rage. You get start getting to why mm -hmm. you feel this way. And then you start getting to a point of deep joy. You can't have joy without wow. having gone through that process. Mm. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible, man. And that's so true. And I feel like one of the most amazing things that 
being sober and in recovery is responsibility for yourself yeah. and taking accountability exactly. and you're not a victim. Exactly. I mean, yes, we Very get cool. to, yes, we, you know, we get to look at the people that may have harmed us or caused us certain trauma. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like you said, it's whose face am I looking in the mirror and yeah. who, you know, what yeah. body am I living in and, and the responsibility that, I get to take, not that I really, not that I have to take, but that I get to take yeah, now. That's right. So, um, that's powerful. That's beautiful, man. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, well, we reached an hour here, Luis. Wow. I do want to ask you though. Yeah, I know, man. It's great. We could great be here talk. forever. <laughs> yeah. I do want to ask you, what are you writing these days? What are you working on? Well, actually, I have four books. I know it's kind of crazy. I already have 16 books published. I have four books that I want to do. But one of the things I am doing is I'm trying, we talked about film. I'm trying to get into that space too. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. Races, all kinds of things. Uh, it takes a lot of money, which I don't care about. But I'm trying to write a script. Part of that's always running story. I'm trying to make it into a script. I got a, a well-known director, producer that wants to help me, which is good. I don't want to mention him because we're not there yeah. yet i'm trying to get yeah. into more theater i had a great successful play just before the pandemic i did always running as a play it was sold oh, out wow and it was awesome. great and then i want to pick up the theater thing i'm trying to get more into the art that i love which is again those mm -hmm. metaphors those stories of poetry i got a book of poetry mm -hmm. i want to put out i got a novel short stories so that's my right now i'm running for governor but i'm i'm not forgetting these other important things the things i'm really more passionate about which is getting those stories out and getting that writing put together. Amazing. I love that. Thank you, man. And I look forward to all that. I'd love to see uh, Always Running as a play. That yeah, hopefully we'll redo it. I mean, we'll get other people to do it. That'd be great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Luis, for right. joining me today. And um, I'm really excited to, uh, you know, continue introducing your work to as many people as possible. Thanks so much. I pretty appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, man. Have a great day. All right.